for it, wait for it. All right, thank you everybody for uh, attending and joining the uh, Conveyor Community Meetup today. Uh, today we have um, a great topic of uh, you know, migrating applications to Kubernetes, modernizing them with the Migration Toolkit for Applications. Um, uh, my name is James Labaki. We have uh, uh, a great crew, uh, uh, Marcus Nagel, Miguel Perez Colino, Phil Katnach, and Marco Rizzi here to present on the topic and do a demonstration. Um, the call is being recorded. Um, and uh, so we will post the recording just like we do every time uh, on there. So Miguel, do you want to hit the next slide real quick? Sure. Um, so just to let you guys know, there's a Conveyor community meetup. Um, you can go to conveyor.io if you want to see all the meetups. I would encourage you also to click on the forum button there and click join group. Um, right now we are sending invites to several mailing lists um, and kind of finding people that would be interested in participating in this community. Uh, it's a completely upstream community. The goal is to begin uh, catalyzing a community that we bring practitioners uh, together, sysadmins, developers, and uh, you know uh, different different engineers uh, that are working on solving these problems of how you break down monoliths, adopt containers, and embrace Kubernetes. Um, so I'd encourage you to join that mailing list as we will slowly start only putting invites over to that mailing list. Um, at the end of the session, we'll also present, we'll send a survey out like we always do to get your feedback, which we do take and share as well. Um, and with that, I will uh, invite you to enjoy the talk and turn it over to, uh, to Marcus Nagel. Hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, just a few words uh, about me. I'm with Red Hat Consulting. Uh, I'm Senior architect, and my primary focus is, as you can see on the screen, migration and modernization. And I'll try to stick to my five minutes. So, uh, uh, Miguel, if you could advance to the next one, please. So, just a few words about uh, how we, as Red Hat Consulting, typically, typically tackle uh, um, uh, application migration, uh, 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 application migration projects. So, typically. <clears throat> it all starts at Red Hat with a discovery session where we level set um, where we level set uh, where the customer wants to go, uh, where you as a customer or uh, you as a developer uh, need to go, what your priorities are, why uh, you're moving to uh, to Kubernetes uh, and Open OpenShift as such, and uh, what your portfolio looks like. Now, in the in the actual project, uh, we start with what we call Navigate, which is a prescriptive set of workshops that help uh, identify gaps and uh, the technology landscape um, uh, that we're dealing with, like CI/CD processes, et cetera. And then we come to the to the core point here, the application assessment, which I'll uh, talk about uh, uh, in, uh, in the next slide, uh, basically assessing uh, what's, the, uh, what's the portfolio that we're talking about in terms of applications. Um, uh, when we have done that, or it can also be in in, uh, in, in parallel after the first uh, few applications, that depends on the project setup. I'll leave all the nitty-gritty details out here. Um, we can, uh, if uh, if necessary, prove the um, uh, the technology. Let's just say you have uh, you're coming from let's uh, let's just pick uh, you you come from web logic and you're using some proprietary methods and now you're uh, looking at running on Wildfly for example, um, and uh, you have some uh, you have some libraries that need to be replaced with open source uh, uh, libraries and then you can prove okay this is a technical proof point this is working. Then you move these, uh, you move a few pilot applications to a production-ready uh, minimum viable product. So to prove the point, okay, this whole approach as such is working. Um, you will learn a couple of things uh, in, the, in these first steps, and uh, you will document all these in an uh, in an onboarding process. So uh, this is not strictly waterfall. It's just a little bit hard to. Uh, 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 to present in a meaningful manner here. So uh, the onboarding process will be built from um, from what you're learning in the uh, application assessment. Obviously, in the in, from the first steps in your in your navigate, 
Um, and so this, this will form a, a repeatable onboarding process for new applications uh, for basically for your backlog. And then in the expand phase, what we call a factory approach typically will spread out, pan out into multiple parallel projects uh, um, as you see fit uh, alone or with your partner. Typically, what we uh, what we do is in the first in the first part uh, we're in the uh, in the leading role together with the customer, um, and uh, in the in the later parts uh, uh, we more and more phase over uh, to the customer in the leading role where uh, we just support the uh, the endeavor here. So if you go to the next one. What we're, what we're always asked, okay, so where do I start? I, I have such a big, uh, such a big uh, application portfolio, hundreds of applications, so what do I do? Um, so, well, first of all, uh, you, might, you might have business reasons to, uh, to select applications. <clears throat> Those could be as simple as this is an important application. It could be, uh, could be things like, uh, uh, um, uh, you're coming. One of your components comes to end of life, uh, 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 end of end of support, um, or it could be uh, there's an upcoming re renewal, and I want to move to a new platform to avoid your renewal costs. Uh, things like that. So typically business driven. The next step um, is uh, the uh, operational or also technical filter. We have a tool for that that's called Pathfinder. That is not in scope of this discussion, but uh, it's basically a, a questionnaire-based tool that helps us identify things like, uh, is the team ready? Do, do we have, actually, do we have a team supporting the application? Let's just say you're a traditional company, um, uh, heavily siloed, and uh, then uh, probably applications have been developed, uh, have been handed over to operations, and after that, nothing, uh, uh, nothing has happened uh, to the uh, to the actual application development. Uh, um, uh, the application development uh, has basically stopped, and the the application has um, has just been transferred to uh, uh, to the operations team. So, is there a team supporting the application? Other suitability factors like runtime behavior. Is there a specific startup behavior uh, that the application requires, which is obviously not ideal on Kubernetes? So, you can start from there if, uh, after shortlisting, because in every assessment. Um, there's always the option that the assessment says, okay, this is not a good candidate. So then you would have to deal, there's other options like, uh, uh, for example, OpenShift virtualization. Um, there could be an option uh, leaving it in a VM or there's other options. But uh, when it comes to moving applications onto Kubernetes, uh, there might always be uh, um, um, the not applicable or uh, not av advisable um, outcome of an assessment. So. Having that prioritized backlog, we can uh, we can start from here with uh, with a certain risk, or we can, as we typically do, uh, what we recommend, uh, go uh, one level deeper and do the analysis with the migration toolkit for applications that will help us uh, identify technical risks um, on a uh, on a code level. And with that backlog, with that refined migration plan. You would uh, then go into your uh, application migration. That is actually a cycle because you will learn uh, with the help of the migration toolkit. You will identify patterns. Uh, so, um, uh, what's very important also in, in terms of project is that you need to uh, um, identify and document everything that you learn in a shared knowledge base. Because uh, let's say you have an application archetype, you you're using this type of framework. And the next time your next application from a totally different department is migrated, they can say, okay, if I encounter this topic, then here, um, this, is, uh, uh, this is what we'll do. And uh, this is also one thing that uh, the migration toolkit helps you with the extensibility of rules. Okay, so a few words from the consulting side. Um, next one. Oh, so, thank you, Marcus. Yeah, <laughs> Tommy. Did you want to add anything else? No, no. I'm, I'm. Unless there's questions, we'll answer questions later in the Q and A. But uh, yeah, feel free oh, to pop in I questions. Really, yeah, I really appreciate you joining us. I mean, I know that you've been migrating applications for quite a long time, many kinds of applications in many customers all around Europe and probably in other parts of the world and. And uh, it's good to hear how how this is 
done? You know, how do you start by selecting the applications and how do you filter them? Do you create uh, a list of or backlog of what are we going to do? What is the lowest risk? And what are the stakeholders that need to put uh, to be together to be able to do a successful modernization of applications, especially in, in large companies? So now I'll get into the, the tool. You know, you have seen that uh, there are several phases. One of them is the assessment phase, where you review the applications that you probably have in your portfolio in your company and say, okay, what am I doing with these applications? Uh, how do I review them? And then you can establish, okay, these are the ones I would like to start migrating with. Sometimes you are not in a company, you are just having uh, some applications that you have been managing yourself or for fun, and you want to review them also and think, okay, how can I modernize this? How can I bring these applications that I built some years ago, and I want to bring it into Kubernetes? And this is where, where the migration toolkit for applications can help. So there are some cases that we're covering. Migrating, for example, to OpenJDK, if you're using Oracle JDK, finding those classes that are proprietary that you're using and that maybe you, you, you should move away from them so you don't have to pay to Oracle in case you want to use your JDK. Uh, looking for, um, I don't know, modernizing Tomcat or Spring Boot based applications. Uh, if you are using, for example, uh, community observers or libraries and you want to move them to support it because you want to take them into production, we are also there to cover you. And also uh, um, Apache Camel. We have rules to migrate from Apache Camel 2 to Camel 3. Camel 3 has a lot of features that are specific to Kubernetes and to containers. And uh, for many people who are using uh, integration patterns with Apache Camel 2, moving to Camel 3 is such a huge step forward that they probably are very interested in doing so. And the migration toolkit for applications can help you there. Also, uh, we have rules based on, on, on the 12 factor app definition for containerization. So if you want to containerize your application and you're using something like a, I don't know, a shared session, and, uh, and this shared session is done in a way that is not suitable for containers, we will reach it out and uh, it will help you find uh, what are the issues that uh, were there that you more probably want to, to fix before moving your application into a container. And also break down monoliths and amend understand with uh, uh, agile integration. So what is the migration toolkit for application? So first things first, this is fully open source. There's uh, the, the WindUp project that is uh, is becoming part of, of, of Conveyor. And this project uh, has all the code there for you to, to use it, to review it, to study it, to change it, modify it on, on, on whatever you want. So this migration toolkit is available for you in, in this URL, red.hd slash MTA. You can download it there for free. It's the developer portal of Red Hat, and, and you just could get in there, download it, and, and check it yourself. And we provide it in, in four flavors, to say so. One of them is the, the command line interface for the people who want to do like uh, um, specific things uh, when analyzing an application. Uh, like, for example, automating it or using it in your laptop or in a server or embedded into weird pipelines that you have for your CI CD environment. We also have the web console, which is the easiest one to use. It has a nice interface that you can access and, uh, and uh, upload your binaries or, or, or tell it where your source code is. And then it will analyze it for you and it will provide your reports in uh, HTML so you could go and review them. There are also IDE plugins for your Visual Studio Code and your your Eclipse or Eclipse J, which also have a, a version from Red Hat Code Ready Workspaces and Code Ready Studio that is a curated version of the of the open source uh, uh, projects. And then uh, a plugin for Maven, just in case you want to do uh, the analysis at the build time. So. Once you do the analysis, what does it do? Well, it uh, it reviews the code, it reviews the binaries by the compiling them, and it has a set of rules that are going to tell you, okay, this is what you need to to change and why. And sometimes we even include uh, samples for those rules, you know. So what you're going to see is something like this, you know, a console in which we have analyzed an application, we have a list of applications, and we'll get the dashboard with the rules that were uh, triggered by this application, the mandatory, the optional, 
the potential. And also, for example, if we select it to, to move to containers, we'll have uh, cloud man mandatory um, uh, rules that were triggered and tell you, look, you need to change this kind of, uh, of code that you have into something like this uh, with uh, links to, to documentation helping you do so. So the web console again to help you there um, analyze the application and review um, it. These are some examples you see on the left you get a list of issues. You click on the issue and you see on the right um, the report on what needs to be changed and why. In this case, it's a, an enterprise Java Beans XML definition that is specific to web logic. That if you want your code to be more portable, you want to bring it to to JEE standardized application servers, well, you, you could consider uh, modifying this. Again, the IDE plugins, uh, one example here, you could review the code directly with uh, MTA, with the migration toolkit for applications, and it's going to tell you, okay, these are the things that I found, this is the explanation on what was found and, uh, and um, recommendations on how to change the code. And last but not least, the use cases. So as you see, we are uh, we have rules for migrating from A to B, and some of the things we do are with around uh, application servers, which was the traditional use for MTA, like moving from WebLogic to JBoss CAP, from WebSphere to JBoss CAP, which are normally um, just rules that are more to make your application more Java EE compliant. So you just increase the mobility. And also checking the Oracle JDK, checking for Linux, in case you have uh, things that are specific to Windows, checking for Spring Boot and, and Camel 2. And we are adding new rules to be able to migrate from Spring Boot to Quarkus that are going to be released in the next version, 5.1.0, um, by the beginning of, uh, of December. So this is what uh, MTA does. And now um, a bit of the roadmap, okay, just a tiny thing. Uh, of, of course, roadmaps are subject to change. So as Marcus has said before, we have the application migration toolkit that is being renamed into migration toolkit for applications, and we have FAPA, which is uh, to analyze the code, and we have Pathfinder to assess the suitability of applications to run on containers, or for example, like on OpenShift, uh, to run on Kubernetes. And, um, and we want to put them together in uh, the migration toolkit for applications. So you can go from the assessment part of the application portfolio that you could have to the analysis part, all in the same place. So um, uh, for the migration toolkit for application that is about to come, as I was saying before, we have we will have a new web UI based on Part and Fly 4, a new operator to deploy it on OpenShift using an operator to deploy it on, on Kubernetes uh, whenever possible using an operator, and of course the Spring Boot to Quarkus rules. So this is what is coming. So stay tuned, and uh, and um, and well, and we'll let you know when we have this uh, ready. But uh, it's, it's pretty well baked already, so it will be not uh, long until it's available for all of you. And then the roadmap to integration. We already de uh, delivered uh, 5.0. We are working on 5.1. We are redesigning uh, Pathfinder for the roadmap to integration. And uh, we're going to have an app inventory, and we're going to have stakeholder controls, so it makes it easier to control the the, uh, the whole inventory of of applications that you have uh, already available. And once we have the app inventory and Pathfinder ready uh, for with their own operator and ready to run on OpenShift, we'll merge it with the current app analysis tool, the migration toolkit for applications, in one single um, uh, tool that will be available in, in the conveyor community and will be uh, offered as a, as a um, operator. So you could consume it very easily in any Kubernetes environment or on OpenShift. So that's all from me. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so uh, Phil could uh, take over it. Uh, thanks for listening. Phil, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Just give me a second and I'll start my presentation. Bear with me.
Sorry guys, I don't seem to have the ability to present at the moment. Um, if you give me one second, Phil, let me just be able to present because you're not blocked from audio and video sharing. In. Sorry about the delay, guys. No kidding. Hopefully, you can see my screen now. Yep, we can. Right. <clears throat> okay, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, my name is Phil Katanaka. I'm the engineering manager uh, for the Migration Toolkit for Applications. And I'll just give you a brief demonstration of the uh, web UI. Um, first thing I probably should do is um, just um, just give you a little bit of information as to where you can find more information about the Application Migration Toolkit. Um, migration toolkit for applications as it's been rebranded uh, on the developers website um, we there's lots of information about the migration toolkit for applications there's a nice overview video uh, there's the links to all the downloads we have several different dis distributions that you can use to perform an analysis you've got the web console and um, which you can run locally um, or you can run within OpenShift we've got the command line interface that's um, Miguel was talking about, and the command line interface really is the, is the workhorse of uh, the migration toolkit for applications. Um, and with all of the, diff the different distributions that we have, the CLI, the web UI, the, the plugins that we have for the various different IDEs, they all provide functional parity in terms of what they deliver. They all will accept the same analysis configuration parameters, um, allow you to analyze multiple applications and generate the same set of uh, reports and outputs. Yeah. Um, so the three different uh, distributions of uh, IDE plugins that we have at the moment, and the most established one is the the plugin for Eclipse and uh, Code Ready Studio, which is um, Red Hat's version of Eclipse. Uh, we've got a Visual Studio plugin and an Eclipse Share uh, Code Ready Workspaces plugin as well. Um, they're available to use. They're not as mature. Um, they're just available as tech previews at the moment. But um, you know we have a lot of confidence that they are working effectively. So please feel free to play with them and then from this page you can get all of the all of the official downloads for the latest releases and as Miguel mentioned there'll be a release 510 coming the first week in December. Uh, other information um, regarding the um, migration toolkit for applications and um, there's some really nice videos that are it make it very straightforward to install the web UI either locally on with or with an open shift these are very intuitive to use um, and then we've got all of the links to the official documentation and um, for there's a documentation guide for each of the different modules um, and and a rules development guide and um, so um, really the, the rules are what drives um, the migration toolkit for applications it is essentially a rules engine and um, you can write rules using uh, XML or groovy and the, the the content of the rules are executed um, if you supply the appropriate parameters for those rules to be considered for selection. Um, so I'll, I'll discuss the rules a little bit um, in, towards the end of this particular presentation. But what I'll do now is, is just go into a demonstration and show you um, the, the migration toolkit for applications in action. OK, then. So this is the web console. Um, and uh, I did a little bit of preparation for this morning and I created um, several projects just for the purpose of making the demonstration slick. You can see there's, there's four projects there um, that I created earlier today. And basically, the, 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 within MTA, the concept of a project is just a logical grouping of applications that you want, want to analyze as a, as a unit. And um, so um, typically, these applications will have something in common. And you would probably, when you analyze them as a group, um, you will be using the same configuration parameters for the analysis. Um, so I've created four applications, four projects here. Um, one of which is for you know the traditional use case for the migration toolkit for applications, which was basically uh, taking um, um, traditional Java AE monoliths and migrate them across from WebLogic or WebSphere onto EAP. And then assessing them for um, um, cloud readiness, and 
uh, also also potentially assessing them for suitability for migration from Oracle JDK to Open JDK. And then um, some of the other example projects are for the more recent use cases, which is migrating Spring Boot applications, you know, onto the Corpus runtime. And um, with the migration toolkit for applications, it is extensible. So the, the rules, um, although they are very comprehensive and got a very rich set of rules, we do encourage users to develop their own rules for their own particular circumstances. And if their rules are going to be of benefit to other people, then share those, share those rules with uh, the team and the um, conveyor community so that um, these rules can be of benefit to everybody. OK, then. So um, what I'll do is I'll create a new project and show you the wizard, and that will give you, um, you know, a nice uh, overview of the, of the workflow. And then I'll kick off an analysis. And when the analysis is running, I'll then take you through some of the um, existing reports we have for these pre-prepared projects. Right then. So to create a project, you need to give it give it give it a name. Uh, so and optionally um, a, a description. So let's go to the demo project and click on next. This will take you to a dialogue where it allows you to either supply a directory path to where your application archive files are or to upload an individual application archive. So I'll, just, I'll use that and I'll go to my application archive files, and choose two or three applications to analyze, click open. These files are uploaded and next thing it wants you to do is basically choose the migration path. Yeah. Um, so this is the transformation path um screen as it stands at the moment and um, we are all going to have some new icons for the course and red hat runtimes and um, targets but um before we get the this version finalized but you can see here these are the, the primary um migration paths that we support there are other targets available that you can select in the advanced options part of the uh, analysis configuration and um, but these are the primary ones and the ones that are most useful and hence these are the ones that we highlight on this particular screen yeah so by default the eap7 target is selected and uh, to migrate across from say a web studio a web logic to eap or potentially upgrade from an earlier version of eap to the latest version of eap we are always working with the eap team to make sure that uh, our rules are in tune with the very latest release of eap Containerization rules um, are all about um, ensuring that your application is um, cloud native and it satisfies um, all of the criteria that you would expect. Um, so no, no hard-coded IP addresses, no RMI calls, RPC calls, that kind of thing. Um, so it's all of the 12-factor app considerations really are, in, are in, encoded within our um, cloud readiness rules for containerization. We also have some rules to make sure there's no uh, Linux, sorry, no Windows uh, paths, you know, encoded within your application. And we also have a set of rules uh, that check for um, Open JDK to Oracle JDK compatibility. And if there are any or any sort of arcane Oracle JDK uh, methods or classes embodied and um, um, encoded within your application, you know, we will pick these things up and um, alert the user to these things. Yeah, we've got rules for Camel 2 to Camel 3 migration, uh, Spring Boot to Quarks migration, and um, also for the versions of Spring Boot that are supported by Red Hat runtimes. But with these applications that I selected, um, all being traditional monoliths, what I'll do is I'll just select those four targets at the top and proceed from there. Yeah. Next. This gives me a list of packages, uh, and what the application does is it's clever enough to use the Maven index to figure out um, which uh, Java libraries have been put, or make up your application and which ones are standard sort of framework libraries that we don't want to analyze, and which uh, libraries are things that have been written by the customer and therefore need to be analyzed. Yeah, so uh, the, the pack, this, the package um and you can you can change which packages you choose to analyze if you are not comfortable that um mt here has got it exactly right and you can you know interact with these dialogues moving packages from the selected included to the excluded um as you see fit but um 
uh, my experience is it's it's very good at getting the packet selection right and I very rarely have to interact with this dialogue. Uh, click on next and this is where you have the option to add custom rules so these are rules that you've developed yourself um, and you want will complement the set of rules that are supplied as standard um, or you can also uh, add custom runtime labels and when I when I demonstrate the reports um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll illustrate what these custom labels are all about and, and what their utility is um, but I'll not demonstrate just adding a, a custom label just at the moment. I'll come to that a little bit later on in the demonstration. And then there's some advanced options which allow us to do um, uh, some additional things, such as export, you know, generating links to export the reports to CSV files, and um, be a bit more selective about which rules get executed, that kind of thing. And um, so the purpose of this example, I just click one of those advanced options and I will um, enable the export CSV. So you can see here the, the, the targets that I selected on the transformation path screen, EAP7, Cloud Readiness, Linux, um, and um, OpenGDK were, are all selected. Let me have a look, where's OpenGDK? And these, these ones, uh, then there's some additional targets that we can potentially um, there's the OpenGDK one there. There's some additional targets that we could potentially um, select as well. So the transformation paths dialog is just a shorthand way of populating this particular uh, field, and you can manipulate the field on this screen as well if you if you choose to. All um, all of each analysis must have at least one target, and uh, however, it's optional to have a source. So, um, and what the source is is just a, a you know a more a way of making the rules more selective. So, for example, if you were um, interested in um, migrating a WebLogic application across to EAP7, then you would potentially nominate the source of WebLogic as uh, rather than just leaving the source field blank. And that just makes the analysis more efficient because what the analysis process does is it says let's have a look at all of the rules that are available to us let's find the ones that have a target that match the the, the analysis configuration target and optionally if the a source has been nominated by the user then also select the subset of rules that have that match the source criteria as well um, and clicking next will take me through to the review screen, which just gives you a high level summary of your configuration. And then when you click save and run, it takes you into um, the active analysis panel, shows that this, this analysis is about to start running. And what, what as it runs, it gives you an update along the top, progress bar showing where we are. Yeah, so that's, that's the process for configuring an analysis, selecting, Selecting applications to analyze, choosing what your target is, um, and adding any additional criteria that you want to uh, be active during the analysis, such as custom rules and custom labels and advanced options. When this is running, I'll just switch over to an earlier project that I created, and you can see here that this particular analysis is completed now. Um, and this link here is to the reports. The reports can also be, get, be reached through the, the kebab menu. Uh, this icon here is to, to download the CSV file of all of the issues that have been generated. There's also the option to delete the reports. Um, if I click on the reports icon, it'll open up the reports um, main page, which is the application list. And um, the way the reports are structured is um, a reflection of the fact that a project comprises of many applications and there are some project level reports which are these ones that you can see here and then for each application there's some application level reports that you can drill into as well so the main report is the application list you can see the three applications that I selected for analysis um, uh, with a list of um, technologies that have been identified by the rules that sit underneath each of these application names. Uh, we have a total number of story points 
which are how much work we think is involved in migrating the application to its target, and those and the number of incidents. And those incidents are classified into different categories, such as migration mandatory, so things that you must do, migration optional, things that are you know potentially you, you might want to consider doing, and then there's also cloud mandatory, cloud optional, and informational. Um, and you can see the breakdown of incidents based upon uh, those different categories. And again, all this information is driven by the rules. Um, these JBoss, EAP, and JWS, what these are, are uh, target runtime labels. And um, this is best explained in the context of the labels legend. Click on there. What you can see is all of these technology tags are being color coded as green, red, or, or, or black in effect, or dark gray. And the green are, are things that are supported by that particular runtime. The red ones are technologies not supported by that runtime. Um, the, the dark gray ones have no influence on whether this application is suitable for that particular runtime or not. And everything else that's you know technologies that are typically embedded within an application that aren't linked to a particular runtime, or classed as amber, which is partially supported. Yeah, so green is supported, amber is partially supported, red is unsuitable, and, and the, the dark gray ones are neutral. And then if you click on one of these target runtime labels, all of the technology tags are colored in the context of that particular target runtime label. So you can see for this particular application, the blocker to this application being suitable for JBoss EAP is that it's got a WebLogic Web XML technology embedded within it, and that needs to be replaced by the equivalent uh, JBoss file. Yeah, all of the other enterprise application, um, Java E um, technologies, you know, that are supported out of the box by EAP are highlighted in green, and all the other technologies that are sort of embedded um, are highlighted in amber. Yeah, um, if you were to click on uh, JWS um, uh, target one time label. So this is JBoss Web Server. Um, basically, all of the, the only technology tags that are supported by JWS are the, are the server technologies, as you'd expect. Um, so you can see the subset of, of technology tags that are green for JWS are quite small, and you can see all of the Java AE technologies aren't supported by, by JWS. But this is very useful in terms of customers who want to migrate applications that they have running on an enterprise application server such as WebLogic or WebSphere and these are these are server applications that, that, that would be suitable for Tomcat or JWS and um, so this this um, target runtime label feature is a very uh, intuitive way of understanding um, whether an application can be deployed at JWS or whether it requires you know a full enterprise application platform to support it yeah so that's the, the main uh, the main report and um, as I say um, what target runtime labels are all about. We have a nice technology bubble map which gives you a list of technologies that are each application embeds broken down by the tiers of the application. So we've got view, connect, store, sustain, execute. Um, and within each of these, it gives you details of what technologies have been discovered in the context of that particular um, vertical uh, partition. But if you want to see this in a bit more information, what you can do is click on the individual application, and you can see it broken down in a lot more detail by um, those technologies, which are Java E technologies, and those technologies which are embedded. Um, so you can see. Uh, a lot more detail um, on this particular report, which is summarized on the previous bubble map. Yeah. Um, also within the reports, we have a dependency graph. And at this level, project level, it just shows you um, the relationships between um, the main components, uh, the, so the EFRs, the WAR files, and the, the uh, embedded and the JAR files that are um, customer specific, if you like not framework jar files. I don't know whether on the on the presentation you can see it because sometimes uh, hoverovers don't work on, on Lim genes, but if you hover over any one of these boxes, um, a, a hoverover label pops up telling you the name of that particular archive file. Um, 
Uh, so that's the main reports at, an, at a project level. And then if you drill into an individual application, you can see um, the reports about that individual application. So the first one is a dashboard, which gives you a breakdown of the number of instances that have been discovered by the rules, uh, by the various different categories, uh, and by, by packages. The issues report to me is the is the really important thing. And the issues report is is um, a direct output of the rules. So if you were to look at a particular issue, it tells you which file that issue has been discovered in. Um, it tells you more information about that particular issue and it gives you a hyperlink to supporting some supporting information. And the really nice thing is that it, if you wanted to see the rule that generated that issue, um, it, you click on that rule and it will expand and it will take you through to the rule um, that has fired in order to generate the issue. Yeah. Um, so that's a nice sort of um, segue into how our rules are structured. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just pick, pick a particular rules file and show you how rules are structured. and um, and talk you through that a little bit. So the rules, this one is written in XML. Um, all of our rules files have a, have a name that um, ends with the suffix .wineup.xml um, or .mta.xml. And each rule set must have an identifier. So this particular rules set is called Spring Boot Actuator to Quotas. So this is one of the Spring Boot to Quotas migration paths rule sets. Um, within there, it's it, it's defined what the source technology is, so it's obviously Spring Boot, and what the target technology is, which is Quarkus. And each rule within your rule set has an ID, um, and this rule set's only got one rule in. And the, the, the way the rule is structured is there's two main parts to it, one of which is the when criteria, and the second of which is the perform criteria. So the when criteria is, is what selection criteria must the application um, exhibit, in order for the rule to fire. And in this case, what we are looking for is um, one of four things, either um, a particular artifact um, is embedded within the, the UberJar file, which is in this case, it's the Spring Boot Actuator art artifact, or any of these artifacts has been declared with, as dependencies within the application's POM file, yeah? And if any of those conditions are true, then the rule will fire. And when the rule fires, what it will do, it will generate a, an issue, and the issue will have this title here. Uh, replace the Spring Boot Actuator Dependency with the Quarkus Small Rye Health Extension. It'll give you an effort, number of, which is the number of story points that um, we estimate um, the, the change to require and a categorization. So in this case, it's a mandatory change. It's something that you must do. And then you see a message which gives you a little bit more uh, information about what needs to be done, and then a link to um, the appropriate guide in the courts.io uh, website. Yeah. So that's how the rules are structured. Um, going back to the reports, um, the application details report is a nice one. Um, it, it, it gives you a nice explosion broke breakdown of how the application archive file is constructed and all of the jar files and more files that are embedded within it, um, which is a, a different way of showing the sort of dependency graph that I showed you before. And again, um, list of issues within there. The technology grid that I showed you before, which is application specific, um, and then another report, dependency graph report, which is a little bit more granular than the, the one at the project level, because all of the third party jars that were deliberately excluded when you look at this report at a project level uh, are actually detailed um, when you uh, view this report at an application level. You can switch them off and if you want to uh, and make the report a little bit more focused or, or switch them back on again. Yeah. Um, so those are the main reports, if you like, within within the application toolkit. I just go back to the console, and uh, what I'll show you is some other projects reports that have. Go back to the projects list. 
So we'll look at the reports for the spring book to Quagus migration. Uh, here's a couple of applications that were, I selected for analysis earlier today. Click on the on this on the second one of the two, and go to the issues list. You will see um, you know the sorts of changes that we are recommending for um, replacing Spring Boot modules with their Quagus equivalent. So the first one is um, you need to replace the Spring Web artifact with a Quagus Spring Web extension. You know, so this is a direct replacement of a Spring. Um, boot module with the equivalent Quarks extension. Yeah. Um, as a, and you can see here, that there's an awful lot of content for migrating this application from Spring Boot to Quarks. So um, you can see that the Spring Boot to Quarks uh, rule set is, is becoming quite mature now. Um, going back to my project list, uh, the project three has a custom runtime label. And uh, so what I did in this particular case was added a new um, custom runtime label uh, into the analysis configuration and it was called WebLogic. And you can see when I click on target runtime labels, um, the definition of the WebLogic target runtime label um, is included in the legends at the top. And the, the only difference um, from the EAP one is that uh, WebLogic technologies uh, or class has been supported rather than unsupported. So if I was to click on WebLogic target runtime label in the context of this particular application, what was red for Jade Boss EAP is now shown as green for um, WebLogic. Yeah, so that's what the target runtime labels do. And again, going back to another one of my re previously prepared reports with a custom rule click on project four um, and go to the reports go to the issues list what you can see here at the top of the issue list is an issue that's been generated from a custom rule and um, so i was to click on that particular incident and show the rule behind it what you will see um, is Spring Boot Web to Quarkus Custom, which is the custom rule that I created earlier today, um, which will fire when it finds either a, an embedded JAR file for the Spring Boot Startup Web artifact, or um, a, a de declaration in the POM of the Spring Boot Startup Web dependency. And, and when, that, when that particular condition is satisfied, then it'll generate this particular issue, which is um, custom rule to replace the Spring Web artifact with a Quarkus Spring Web extension. So I just based this custom rule on an existing uh, rule within our rule set just for the purpose of illustrating um, um, how easy it is to develop your own rules and uh, add them to an analysis. And then what I can do is I can go back to one of my projects, five, and um, go to the analysis configuration and go to the custom rules and add a custom rule, browse it, um, and let me find my custom rules folder. Yeah, and then there's, there's three Spring Boot to Quarks ones there, none of which will be really suitable for this application, but I just want to illustrate how easy it is to add these custom rules. And then once, the, once they've been added, delete that one. Um, you can just enable them, and the next time you run the analysis, those custom rules will fire. Likewise, with the custom labels, very easy to add a custom label. And the next time the analysis runs, it will include that custom label uh, definition uh, into the analysis and generate the custom web logic target runtime label on the analysis list. Yeah. Um, these rules are linked to a particular project, so project five. These, however, the ability to add custom rules and custom labels, um, that will apply to all projects. If you want to add, add global custom rules and custom labels, then you would just interact with these, config, with these particular dialogues. Um, and what you can see is all of the rules that are uh, provided by um, out of the box, included in your distribution, and then also the ability to add 
additional ones yourself. And it's exactly the same process uh, as I demonstrated for the project related custom rules and custom labels. And um, that's pretty much everything I, I have to demonstrate at the moment. Um, as, I, as I say, the, the really important thing that's, that, that's, you know, I need to stress with regards to the migration toolkit for applications is it's extensible. Um, we are looking to develop new rules all the time, but, you know, contributions from the community were very well received um, by ourselves, so they could be made beneficial to everybody. And regardless of which uh, MTA module you choose to engage with, whether it's the CLI, uh, the Web UI, the Maven plugin, or even any of, any of our IDE extensions, all of these um, different distributions produce the same set of reports. So they all provide the same ability for providing configuration parameters and also generating um, the same set of outputs, regardless of which which particular distribution you use to do the analysis. And um, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for your time. Back to James. Hey, thanks, Phil. Thanks for the uh, great demonstration. Awesome, uh, awesome demo. Thanks, uh, Miguel, Marcus, and Marco for uh, presenting, supporting in the Q and A. Um, hope you all found this session useful. I did paste a link to a session survey. Uh, in the chat, we'd appreciate if you could uh, click on that and take the survey. Also, if you want to continue the conversation or discuss this topic or any other topics that are uh, um, related to uh, migrating your applications and modernizing them to Kubernetes, uh, please join uh, Pound Conveyor, hashtag Conveyor, on the Kubernetes Slack. Or um, again, go to conveyor.io, click on forum, and hit join group. Uh, we appreciate you joining. We will send a email to the mailing list afterwards with a link to this recording and, uh, and the slides as well. So thanks again to the presenters and everybody who joined us today, and we'll see you on the next meetup. Thanks.